Hello, culmination. Culminators. I have to stop saying culmination. This is not a nation gag. It's a culmination gag. Julie Kelly. It's amazing that we snagged Julie Kelly because she's so busy doing all the things, all the news, all the everything. Welcome, Julie. You and I have been have, have been Twitter friends for years now, and it is our first face to face. I I know that listeners are starting to get a little tired of my making that observation at the beginning of these uh, interviews. But what, what can I say? It's exciting. Well, that's true. And I mean, as much as we like to bash Twitter, the point is that we've all connected with lots of people who we otherwise wouldn't have. And so, yes, we have been Twitter friends for a while. And I appreciate your having me on, especially such a busy week for you. It has, has been a busy week and uh, you really only know a little fraction of it, uh, but uh, it, all, it will all come out. Good. You, though, always seem very busy. You have focused almost obsessively, though, in the last few months on treatment of January 6th defendants and all the stuff going on around that. And in order to avoid asking you to recapitulate stuff that you're publishing and saying all over the all over the place and also to be a little bit true to my to my topic. What I thought would be interesting would be for us to talk about the way the media has reported, but most significantly not reported okay. the the situation. I mean, we know we know that they're biased as hell. We know that they're not interested in the truth. All those things they're a given. But you're you must have observations based on your experience and based on you know what you're doing that are sp specifically lend themselves to this situation. I think that's such a good question, and it's really something I haven't been asked a lot about and. I keep wanting to write about because it is so important how the media is conducting itself, vilifying these defendants uh, and really all Americans who voted for Donald Trump and the way that they describe people, even nonviolent offenders, trespassers, people who had no idea that they were committing any sort of crime that day is really beyond over the top. Um, you know, I, I just posted this morning on Twitter and my Twitter is Julie underscore Kelly, too, if anyone wants to see the interview that Tucker did with uh, Tom and Sharon Caldwell. And I've interviewed them several times. But what was new to me was Sharon talking about how as Tom was sitting there in handcuffs on January 19th, they heard their voicemail and they got a call from a Washington Post reporter who yes, obviously had that. been tipped off. As we know, the Washington Post, Devlin Barrett, you know, one of the key Russian collusion propagandists, um, leaving a voicemail at their home as they're sitting there in cuffs, completely stunned, their house is getting ransacked and want to quote. So that was just the start of it. As bad as the media coverage of Russia collusion was, I think it's actually going to be worse for uh, what we're seeing with January 6th. So there's your tweet. Just watch Tucker's interview with Tom and Sharon Coldwell. Their home was raided, ransacked by FBI on 119.21. Sounds like something that happened to a client of mine just a couple of days ago related to his nonviolent activity on January 6th. Tom reveals as he sat in handcuffs that morning that a Washington Post reporter called their home. Isn't it amazing how fast the Washington Post found out about that? It is amazing. And what the Caldwells didn't realize is most Americans don't. She told me, well, we were just shocked. How would a reporter already know and call, be calling us? Um, and so, of course, I sort of had to explain to them, well, this is how they operate. This is what the FBI DOJ does. They tip people off. You, as you said, um, what happened with your clients, we've already seen examples of the media being outside of people's homes as the FBI shows up. We saw that certainly with um, the Roger Stone case. So it's nothing new, but for innocent Americans like the Caldwells, really decent, good people who don't understand the depravity of both our government and our corporate news media, it really was a shock to them. And so that was just really one example of how insidious uh, this uh, national news media has been to people ensnared in this abusive investigation into January 6th. I, I think this is a really important point, and, and it actually wasn't what I was, even though I had just read your tweet, 
I forgot about it as soon as I asked the question. Because what they report and what they decline to report is, as I said in asking the question, is old news. It's old news. We know that, that anyone who's interested in what's really going on has to at least balance out their uh, enjoyment of the corporate entertainment news with the kind of news that they can find on, even if it's only Twitter, even if you don't click through to anyone else's blog, at least you're going to find out that there's another world out there. But far beyond that is the merging, the consolidation of these corporate media outlets right. with government. It's really, really problematic. Well, there was another good example of that today on Real Clear Investigations, Paul Sperry, who did a very detailed account of Sergey Millian and how the media immediately vilified him, made all sorts of accusations about him. These are the same people, right? The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, uh, who are all in cahoots with Glenn Simpson, Fusion GPS, um, you know, then legitimized by sources at the FBI and DOJ. And they just smeared this man for years. And now that we know he did nothing wrong, he was a victim in all of this, like so many others, these or news organizations still refuse to apologize to him, to retract their stories. Um, and you see it right there. And he has reached out to them. And I know the Washington Post, uh, one of their editors said, well, we're looking into our previous coverage of this. Apparently, he can't get a response from the Wall Street Journal. But you know, Ron, we, you know this better than I do as an attorney in covering this. They can do whatever they want with impunity and they have no conscience. They don't care about the lives that they're destroying. Whether it's Donald Trump or Carter Page, Sergey Millian, or it's people like the Caldwells who've never committed a crime in their entire lives. In fact, he's a veteran uh, for years, a, a, a Navy uh, Lieutenant Commander who also was an FBI intelligence uh, officer. And look at how they're treating all of these people. Um, and so that is really, uh, it's hard to find a more insidious, dangerous, destructive force in our country right now than the national news media. You know, well, but if there is one, it's the prosecutorial class. Or the DOJ, right. <laughs> and, and the DOJ and also, you know, as we're seeing in the Rittenhouse case, um, state prosecutors too, not all of them, not every state, not every office. But there are enough people in every prosecutor's office who are prepared to do anything, anything to achieve goals that are not consistent with justice. And if you th I'm just struck by the similarity between them mm -hmm. and the de facto government, quasi-governmental prosecutors of the national press, because they also, as there's no accountability. There's no regret. They, you know, I'm representing, you know, more than one defamation plaintiff in lawsuits against major media outlets where the facts are so egregious. They grind underfoot the lives and families and careers of the people they destroy in order to advance their own careers. It's, it's chilling. How does a person become like that? They are sadistic. I mean, they actually, and I've listened to so many of these court hearings, and as a non-lawyer, I am disgusted at what I hear federal prosecutors not only say in court, but what they write in these filings using the most inflammatory descriptions of these people as terrorists. Um, I mean, that's just one example of how they are describing anyone who was involved even outside of the building that day, they really consider them domestic terrorists. They want them treated accordingly and they are gratified when people beg for mercy. There are a few cases that really stand out to me. One is a man named Robert Reeder. He pleaded guilty to parading in the Capitol, a low level misdemeanor, as you know, which uh, that plea, that charge has the most plea agreement so far in over about 120 uh, plea deals that have already been struck between the government and defendants. And he begged for his life basically in front of this judge. He said, my life is destroyed. I got fired uh, from my job as a truck driver with FedEx. My family has abandoned me, my friends and neighbors. My church told me 
to stop coming to his church. He has a teenage son with the same name who's being bullied and ridiculed at school. He has nothing left. He begged for mercy. The judge didn't care. The prosecutor didn't care. He got sentenced to three months in jail and they were so happy that they got another scalp. They, they have no humanity left. And we see this in the prosecution of Kyle Rittenhouse, also the media backing them up. You know, once upon a time, Ron, I'm sure you remember, the media used to actually scrutinize cases like this and used to condemn prosecutors who stepped over the line and were involved in political witch hunts. No more. You have the left, uh, the corporate media, even, you know, a handful of Republicans who are fully going along with this to help. You know, the prosecution is only one side of it. What the media does in some case, in many cases, and I've heard this from January Sixers, what the media is doing to them is worse than uh, the criminal prosecution itself. Well, certainly, because, you know, this is a very interesting question. The, the courts are presumptively open. And I've been involved in litigation where things have been sealed inappropriately. And we have sought and succeeded and sometimes succeeded more or less to get stuff unsealed. There's a lot of routine sealing of trivial business information in, in, com in, in commercial cases, for example which really technically violates the guidelines for sealing, but no one really cares. And the irony is the sealing itself is unnecessary because contrary to what the businesses involved think, nobody really cares about their financial information either. Right. I mean, especially middle market businesses, you know, pe people who, uh, you know, unlike you and me, who, who, who merely deal in hundreds of millions of dollars of sales, uh, you know, not major corporations, they are so jealous of the information that, of, that their competitors might find out about them as if someone is really going to go through the gazillions of filings in the Southern District of New York looking for, you know, how much of a write-off did uh, Mandy Weinstein take for, yeah. um, you know, for, for, for a warehouse space in Edison, New Jersey. But <laughs> separate from that, there are, not separate from that, but it's, that's all part of this general scheme that the courts are presumptively open and court proceedings are presumptively open. Now, on the one hand, that has been ripped from us in the FISA context. And that's, that's the fault of our democracy. Republicans, Democrats have voted for this and voted for it over and over again. And even though it's almost certainly, been, I think we can see now that the the ruling that these any rulings that 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 have been made on the constitutionality of the FISA courts really ought to be revisited in terms of what we learned about the, their abuse, okay. but even coming into the the world of the not so dark dockets, when the principles about open courts were first clearly established, in order to go to a court file, you had to go to where the courthouse was located. And you had to go to the clerk and ask to see the file. And you wouldn't necessarily be in a position to make photocopies of material that was filed, but a reporter could. And in fact, in the Southern District of New York, there's still a reporter's, I say still, maybe since we've gone to electronic filing, it's not true either anymore. There, there's a special drawer for the press to see what had been filed that day and see, you know, if anything is going to be is going to be newsworthy. Now we have all this electronic filing and we have digital media and everything that is filed in the courts mm -hmm. can and often is universally uh, distributed. And there are many, many pro-democracy and pro-Republican small r benefits to that. Mm -hmm. But what you also have is that People's lives are very, very readily destroyed, and especially by the drive-by media. They report arrests, and they report investigations, often unconfirmed, unofficial. They virtually never report yeah. acquittals. They don't report, uh, you know, any any. It's it's a it's a disaster. I mean, do, do you think we need to revisit the concept of courts of the proceedings in the courts being? as accessible as they are now? I mean, from where I sit right now, no, because there's no way, 
you know, as far as what's happening in the DC district court, which is handling all the January 6th cases, I can call in and listen to any hearing. Um, and so that's where I've been getting my information, which is super helpful. Of course, I can go on PACER now and I can get any filing, uh, which is very helpful. But to your point, when prosecutors make these allegations in a motion or a filing, calling people <coughs> rioters, insurrectionists, domestic terrorists, et cetera, it, 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 really trying all of these 700 defendants together. And then the media can cherry pick what those descriptions are, have the government's imprimatur on it, put it in a Washington Post article, then they have a justification for calling these people terrorists because that's what the Justice Department called them. So, okay, it's not just the Washington Post making it up or New York Times or CNN. Uh, I mean, these are top prosecutors out of the DC US Attorney's Office. <coughs> and so that is exactly... To your point, it's helpful, but also double-edged sword. So, you, so, so your answer is a really, really good one because what you're saying is, Ron, yeah, it's true that that they're destroying, you know, that, that this instantaneous publication to the whole world of, of what's said and what's done can more rapidly undermine somebody's privacy and somebody's ability to rebuild his or her life. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, at least I can get in there and correct the record to some extent, at least I can report on this and maybe some good will come of it. Whereas if we just leave it up to the official organs and there's no accountability and no transparency at all, we'll be that much worse off. That's exactly right. I mean, look at Carter Page. It was, you know, it we're almost coming up on five years since the Washington Post leaked, illegally leaked the details of the FISA warrant against him. I mean, you took the most private classified application presented to a secret court where Carter Page didn't even know what was going on, had no way to defend himself. It's leaked to the Washington Post and that is used to destroy his life too. And again, you have then the imprimatur of the government calling him a foreign agent. So then it's okay for the entire media to do that. And here we're coming up on five years later. I know that Carter is suing major news organizations, but it's too late. I mean, half the country still views him that way. That's just one example. So for example, when I talk to these January 6th defendants, and in the case of the two men who are charged with spraying Brian Sicknick, a thing the media continues to lie about, which is that he was killed by rioters somehow on January 6th, which is not true. He died of a stroke caused by blood clots, had nothing to do with what happened that day. It doesn't matter because every article, when you pull up their two names, and I've heard this directly from one of the men after he got out of jail, he said, I can't even read what they are saying about me, that I am a cop killer, that I should go to jail forever. Some people want me dead saying that I've killed Brian Sicknick. The whole premise is a lie that Brian Sicknick was killed, let alone anything that George Tanios or Julian Cater did with pepper spray. Um, and so, but it, it, that's how they are going to be remembered in history by major news organizations. They don't even care that the Brian Sicknick story is a complete fabrication that was launched by the New York Times itself on January 8th saying he was bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher, a complete lie, total lie. But it lived for five weeks before they retracted it. But Ron, you know this, pull up, go pull up anything on the Wall Street Journal, CNN, any, any news organization. It will say, some will still say that he was murdered by a fire with people using a fire extinguisher, but it certainly will say that he count him as one of the five fatalities that day. And it is a complete fabrication. And so who, how ultimately do we rectify this? I mean, this can't continue. So that was my question for you because we've established a couple of things here. One of them is that this, this is how the system works now that there's this mm -hmm. Lightning fast, instantaneous, you know, information that's spread around the whole world, and that there's an uphill battle. Although there is a battle that's that that can be, and in your case is, um, in some of our friends' cases, there isn't anymore. Um, but you, you can you can and do wage that that battle. And on the other hand, it seems that that the only thing we can do, or the only thing that could stop this from happening anymore would be for prosecutors and corporate media prosecutors, government prosecutors and quasi-government prosecutors to be better people, which probably isn't happening before the weekend. No. 
forever. For judges to be less, I, I got to tell, I mentioned this in a couple of, of interviews. I, I was privy to an email exchange from one of my clients where there was a, a discussion between a couple of other lawyers who were representing him on another matter in which they referred to the present psychosis of the federal judiciary. Mm. The, the, it is astonishing. And to me, the, the high water mark of this was, the, was what happened with General Flynn. Mm -hmm. The idea that the DC circuit said it was completely cool for a judge to appoint a private prosecutor Right. to make sure that the Justice Department was doing its job. In the same circuit where they just, the, a judge just signed off on an agreement between the Merrick Garland's Justice Department and, uh, who is it from the FBI, who, who got his, uh, his, um, his pension back? Oh, Andrew McCabe. McCabe. There, no, no questions raised by the judge there about whether there was any um, collusion. No. So the, the judiciary, which you would think would be the one to say, hey, listen, and we've heard snippets of it. Judges saying, wait, this is this. Is, I mean, there seem to be a couple of judges with their heads screwed on straight in the D.C. None. Zero. No, none. Even some that we thought were have tur have subsequently turned. I mean, I've been in touch with a couple of lawyers representing uh, defendants down there, and they have the, 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 a number of them were much more optimistic a couple months ago that that it seemed that there would be some reasonable outcomes. And no, nope. where people, I mean, look, people on Twitter are always inclined to say that oh, the judges they're on the take, they're compromised. They, they don't understand, as I said to my in, 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 in an interview with Michael Malice, this is who they are. This is, they don't have to be convinced or pressured or threatened to do this. This is who they are. So what do we do, Julie? I don't know. Again, another thing that has been so shocking and illuminating to me as a non-lawyer, uh, listening to these D.C. district court judges, they are appalling. And this includes the Trump judges. These are people like Trevor McFadden and Tim Kelly. I just painfully had to listen to the hearing with Tim Kelly. Both of those men, as you probably know, are former prosecutors in the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. So, you know, here they're siding with the prosecutors, the government, everything that they ask for. Tim Kelly, I, I don't know where that guy came from. He actually was just like thinking out loud in court what he could do as a judge. He didn't think he had the authority to transfer a defendant who has been abused now in a second prison to transfer him somewhere else. And I'm saying there, I just heard two other judges do it last week. Of course you can't. So they're either completely incompetent, they're not very bright, they're incredibly weak. Uh, I wouldn't even go so far as to call them corrupt. I don't even think they're bright enough to be corrupt. I don't think they're on the take. I just think they're completely incompetent, weak fools. Um, then you have the other side. You still have people like Emmett Sullivan, Amy Berman Jackson, Beryl Howell, who's the chief judge. They are handling directly a lot of these cases. What you hear them say in court about American citizens who went inside the Capitol for 10 minutes. They act like they went in there, you know, with guns drawn trying to take out everyone in Congress when that's not even close to what happened. Um, you have a judge like uh, Tanya Chutkin, who is the judge this week, who uh, denied Trump's request for executive privilege. Of course, Joe Biden now has twice denied his uh, in, uh, trying to invoke executive privilege to stop this ridiculous committee from obtaining all, basically all of his documentary documents, emails, communications meeting, dating back to April of 2020. She's the judge who said, well, Biden's desires about uh, executive privilege overruled Trump. Okay, fine. She also run in four cases, has sentenced trespassers, these parading in the Capitol people, sentenced them to jail time, even over the recommendations of the government, as bad as the government is, even over their recommendations for home detention or for probation. She is putting these people in jail for their 10, 12, 15 minute little jaunt through the Capitol where they took selfies and left. So this is what these defendants are up against. I am not impressed with any of these judges. I think they're all, they've all said the same things. Every single one of them has signed up on pretrial detention orders, even for nonviolent offenders. 
Um, I think I, I will say, I think there's one judge, Judge Maida, Anand Maida, he's an Obama appointee. He's overseeing this 20 person Oath Keepers conspiracy case. He's the only one. He's obviously partisan, but he actually seems capable and bright. The others, they're, it's like listening to, to a bunch of lunatics in a, in a padded room. That's what I hear when I hear these judges. Well, uh, as a lawyer who has, or whose firm has matters pending in that district or at, from time uh -oh. to time will, um, I will let your comments as a, an intelligent American citizen who is close to the action stand on their own without any comment. Um, I don't want to get you in it trouble. Is, you're not going to get me in trouble. Uh, and I, I, but I, even more amazingly, I'm not going to get me in trouble. Okay. You say what you want. And I'm just going to say, look, these are your observations. A lot of it is very hard to understand. Is there, it, so, you know, you know, you sometimes, so, so there's an inclination to say, well, if despite everything, if despite all the gaslighting and all the, you know, manipulation and, and, and all the, all the, all the things, somehow the Republicans were to win back Congress, which mm -hmm. politically looks utterly possible yes. in the next, in the midterm elections, even to the point where they, in theory, maybe had a, a veto proof majority, which is, I don't think that's going to necessarily a likely thing, but let's just for argument's sake, say it happened. It's hard to think that they would do anything about it anyway. They've never, you know, you've got guys like uh, Lindsey Graham, who loves to, to bang the table during hearings and never follows up on anything, never, never holds anyone accountable. Yep. What's going to be? Well, are, are you getting any kind of, are you yourself getting any kind of interference, you know, with your, your ability to do your job and to fight this sort of lonely battle of reporting what's going on? No. No, I, I really haven't. And I, I want to give a shout out to Chris Buskirk, my publisher in American Greatness, because they early on, when I started right out of the box writing about January 6th, and especially the political prisoners, this goes back to early February, um, you know, that was that was considered like not even conspiracy theory stuff. This was like cuckoo land. Uh, you know, of course, everyone who was involved is a terrorist and should be punished. Um, and so they, they've they been uh, so supportive, um, but no, they haven't. And I'll tell you what, even some of the crazy stuff that I get from, from people who are mad about what I'm covering, um, what I hear back from the people who are ensnared in this investigation from their family members, so happy to have a few people speaking out on their behalf because they really are defenseless, voiceless people. They're not people of means. Most of them have public defenders and uh, court appointed attorneys who also hate them. I mean, I've heard what some of these attorneys have said to their own clients. How could you go there and support Donald Trump? I hate Donald Trump. You had one woman, Heather Shainer, who is a radical left-wing court appointed attorney out of DC. She represents several of these. She forced one of her clients to read, a, she gave her a list of books and movies that she had to read and watch so she could come to terms with her white privilege. And this woman also, another one who pleaded guilty to parading in the Capitol, wrote a heartfelt letter to the judge. I, you know, I watched Schindler's List. I, I watched uh, uh, all of these other movies and books talking about how bad America is. Heather Shainer herself says, yeah, America is a great place, except it was founded on genocide and on slavery. So this woman just wanting to go on with her life has no idea. None of these people, most of them have no experience with the criminal justice system, especially in Washington, DC. She writes this letter, basically a mea culpa for her white privilege uh, living in Southern Indiana. And the judge, instead of saying, wait, this is out of line. You are simply here to vet the facts of the case the government has presented. This has nothing to do with her political beliefs. Does the judge say that? No, it's all good. That's fine. So that's just one tiny example uh, of what you're hearing and seeing. Um, but this is what they're up against. Partisan, hateful judges, sadistic prosecutors, um, other court-appointed public defenders who also hate them, and this, and this vicious media. 
I mean, uh, it, it's really uh, such an onslaught that most of these Americans just cannot deal with. And, and it's really sad to hear their personal stories about what, what it's done to themselves and their families. Are you in touch with Emerald Robinson? Mm -hmm. I thought you might be. Today. Yeah. Yes. What was the uh, straw that broke the camel's back? Do you know? Does she know? Well, I think ostensibly it was about her. Team. Just for just for people who are not familiar, Emerald, who had 441,000 followers on Twitter. She's a blue check. She's who did she work for? Who does she work for? Newsmax. Uh, was unpersoned she on was November 8th or 9th yep. for, for violating the Twitter rules. The Twitter rules are that Twitter rules. Um, so what do you, the, what did they say she did or what did she, so it was do, about, what did she say they said? It was about an ingredient that she says is in the vaccine. So I'm not familiar with it. I don't know exactly what she wrote on her sub stack or what she tweeted, but she was suspended for seven days. When she came back on Twitter, <clears throat> she kind of doubled down. She had written about this particular ingredient. And then she was, her account was immediately suspended. I suspect though, Ron, there's more to it. As you know, Emerald is one of two very outspoken and aggressive members of the White House press corps. You see her routinely trying to get a straight answer out of Jen Psaki about anything. The other one would be Pierre Ducey at Fox. So, you know, she's, I'm sure, been on Joe Biden's hit list for a while at his White House's hit not list. Joe, not Joe Biden's. Well, he doesn't know what's going on. He, he yeah, but, but yeah, but I get it. The, the, the Biden administration's hit list, right? That's right. And, you know, there is, again, the seamless, there's a couple people who left Twitter and went to Joe Biden's transition team. One of them was this public policy uh, director for Twitter, left in September of 2020 to go on the transition team. He now works for Pete Buttigieg. You have James Baker, the famous, not Jim Baker, the televangelist or Jim Baker, the former chief of staff in whatever Bush White House. James Baker, as you know, the uh, FBI general counsel who is very involved in Russiagate, he now is general counsel for Twitter. So my suspicion is that part, a big part of why her account is suspended uh, is to punish her for, um, for being a little too aggressive in that uh, White House press briefing room. And the, 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 the vaccine safety and the health information and misinformation um, pretexts are extremely handy they sure because are. they they to, to the to the so another I'm going to invoke Michael Malice again to the midwits <laughs> this this is you know those are those are unassailable good things you are you are you in favor of illness are you um you know, are you against secure elections? Do you want grandma to die? So you can use these as excuses for getting rid of political enemies and nobody will bat an eye. Not that batting an eye would even matter. Well, that was what happened after January 6th. Of course, that is how they finally uh, suspended Donald Trump's Twitter account. And uh, several other people, Mike Flynn, Sidney Powell, um, I think they purged 70,000 or so accounts after January 6th for saying that, you know, that, that they had helped incite the insurrection on January 6th. So whatever, to your point, whether it's vaccines, whether it's mail-in ballots, um, whether it's, you know, anything related to face masks. We saw Scott Atlas in 2020. He tweeted out some things about face masks. He got... Uh, in Twitter jail for seven days about that. So they really can come up with anything uh, because of course, Twitter rules, as you said, and use any excuse to uh, suspend, silence, cancel the detractors of the regime. Julie, an encouraging word of any kind possible to finish off our interview? No. <laughs> well, we're, we're both here. We're... I keep calling myself the Debbie Downer of democracy because sometimes I'll give these speeches or whatever and they're kind of, you know, somewhat, and I'm like, okay, here I am with the terrible news. All is lost. <laughs> um, but no, okay, I'm going to say, I will say this. I do think the narrative on January 6th is turning a little bit. I do think um, some of the detainees are being moved out of the jail. I think that they got, DC jail people got smacked down by the judge and then the U.S. Marshals for 
uh, the heinous conditions in that jail. So I think there's some hope there. I do think this narrative is shifting. And when the trials start next year, we are going to find out a lot more about the FBI's role and also what police did that day to those protesters. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Go back Thank to saving you. America. You're the best. You too. Thanks.